uh, that should be better. So sorry for a little bit uh, non-transparent title, but hopefully I'll clarify. And I would really, really love to be there in person, but uh, as you can see, I'm still contagious, even today. So I think it's better for you if I'm remote. Okay, and uh, on the positive side, I have a great excuse. Uh, apparently, even mild COVID comes with some uh, cognitive decline. So if talk goes badly, I can blame COVID. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I'll be talking about environmental and genetic uh, spaces of diseases, so I'll start with metaphor. And sorry for those of you who fly uh, in near future. I start with plane crash analogy. It's real accident which happened in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina in 2003. And phenotype was uh, this small plane took off uh, stalled for a uh, brief moment and uh, 37 seconds later crashed in Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Okay, and they started investigation and apparently there were two different causes. One of them I call genetic, which is basically a structural problem. When plane was tuned a short while before the event, Turn buckles controlling tension of the cables were set incorrectly, too tightly. So essentially, uh, the elevator control cables were too tight, and the uh, tail of the plane wasn't having a full range of motion. So pilot could not compensate in extreme situation. And there was an environmental reason as well. The plane was actually overloaded and out of balance. And it's interesting why. At this time, they computed weight of the plane by counting passengers and multiplying by weight of average passenger. And uh, average passenger was weighted 20 years earlier. And by this time, average American became about approximately 9 kilograms or 20 pounds heavier. So a plane was overloaded and they didn't know. And my point is that catastrophe would not occur in the absence of either genetic or environmental component because uh, by itself a plane was flyable, but it was overloaded. So this combination essentially resulted in crash. Okay. And a little bit about data, because it's, I know that this tax mining uh, session, but uh, I'm working with large uh, clinical data sets, and uh, they have uh, language-like uh, structure, but uh, in ICD-9, 10, 8, and 11 codes. Uh, essentially, for example, in this case, we have a 15-year-old uh, Hispanic female who had at some point of her life a uh, viral infection at age of six and so on and so on. Okay, and current US data, it's market scan. Uh, as of today, it's 200 million unique people. So it's about two thirds of uh, US population. Uh, currently, it covers 19 years, day level resolution. And we have diagnosis uh, in time at day resolution level and in space at the county level. And just to give you a uh, feeling, this is actual movie computed from this data. It's influenza over nine years in the United States. And each frame is one week. And you can see in the movie that uh, it always comes from the south and it wipes the country from south to north. It never starts in the north for some reason. Uh, by the way, this pattern was broken in uh, 2020 because of the pandemic. We didn't have seasonal influenza this year. Okay, and data, of course, is messy. For example, if you look at uh, weeks of the year at disease prevalence, you would see that all diseases have very coordinated dips uh, the same week. 
and you probably can guess what it is. Of course, it's uh, Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve. So the data contains not only uh, biological, but also social and other information. Okay, and uh, again, I apologize. I know that this uh, text mining and hopefully text mining method will make sense to you. Uh, just in case you didn't, uh, you were not exposed to genetics, uh, I will be talking about heritability and genetic correlations. And heritability, uh, formally, it's proportion of observed variation of particular trait, such as height or absence or presence of disease that is, uh, can be attributed to inherited genetic factors. Uh, as definition tells you, it's really, really model specific because under different models, heritability can change drastically. But that's another story for another time. And genetic correlation is uh, what name suggests. Essentially, when you have two traits, for example, height and weight, right? Uh, it's uh, how tightly these two are correlated. And some traits can be very strongly positively correlated as height and weight, and they also can be negatively correlated. Okay, so first, uh, how it's done properly in genetics, uh, what we did with uh, kind of standard methods uh, published, and first author is Kanix Wang, who just became uh, assistant professor, so I'm very proud. He's uh, a br brilliant scientist. So uh, the standard mo uh, way to do this is to have a model. L is a liability, some hidden parameter, right? And it explained variation of this liability is explained in terms of uh, uh, genetic, environmental, and uh, uh, sh shared environmental factors. I'll explain shortly what it means. So if you have nuclear family, uh, typically, husband and wife are genetically unrelated, but they have shared environment, right? Couple environment. Uh, siblings, they have shared siblings environment and uh, half shared genetics. And parent and child typically shares half of genetics, actually slightly more than half with mother because of mitochondrial uh, the DNA and uh, exactly half with father. So, yeah, uh, we uh, took insurance policies from the market scan and had uh, about approximately half a million people grouped into about 100,000 families. And we were able to estimate heritability for 100 something diseases. And also uh, this estimate, estimated heritability seemed to correlate well with published things. And similarly, uh, family-based correlation correlates really well with uh, whole genome association correlations. Okay, uh, next uh, you can estimate this uh, both genetic and environmental uh, correlations from this data and construct trees. I, I, I'm not going to dive into this part of the uh, work because it's kind of standard way to do things. So now closer to text mining. <clears throat> Essentially, we uh, took uh, semantic embedding methods and applied them in completely inappropriate way. And I'll explain shortly how. Uh, you can think about our life as a grim sentence. From birth, disease, 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 and finally, death, right? It's a long sentence. In reality, in our data, we don't see the whole sentence. Uh, in US uh, insurance records, we only see some interval. But if you, for example, look at uh, Denmark data or uh, Sweden uh, registry data, you can see whole sentences for many people. So in this particular case, we have about 150 million unique sentences. And you can then use them to embed diseases into uh, semantic space. So uh, first kind of glimpse that it makes sense 
it's a testing embedding i know that the testing is not proper way really to look at data because uh, you can tweak parameters and it will change drastically but anyway uh, it does look reasonable things that for example related to sinusitis bronchitis and upper respiratory infection are close to each other uh, okay and it's slightly more fancy way to show the same thing so early onset diseases tend to be together late onset also tend to cluster Cancers tend to be near uh, each other, although they're also separated by uh, organ system. Okay, and it's more detailed disease category. For example, you can see that uh, cataract and conduct disorder, diseases of uh, nervous system are together. And Mendelian and non-Mendelian diseases also tend to be sort of together because Mendelian disease is early onset and even though you probably can't tell from this projection uh, they tend to occupy a proximal part of the space I hope it makes sense okay and another way to look at the same data is to do a tree neighbor journey tree uh, from distances between diseases in this space and for example, if you look at ear, you can see that all ear related diseases are pretty close together in space. Ear infection, genital ear disorder, inner ear disorder, and so on. Okay. And uh, diseases by uh, also tend to cluster by the age of onset. Uh, Mendelian diseases uh, have earliest onset. They, uh, group in one part of space and uh, late on cell diseases are pretty far away okay and uh, I didn't tell you but we used work to back with uh, 20 dimensions don't ask me why or maybe do ask me why 20 uh, and you can see that depression learning disorder and conduct disorder uh, occupy similar but distinct part of the space but if you look, for example, at infections, they also look quite similar, means that they're close in space, but very different from psychiatric diseases. Okay, and another way to look at this is to look at first kind of most distant things that are further away in the disease embedding space. For example, OCD is uh, further away from acute renal failure. Or fasciitis is... Uh, uh, most distant from schizophrenia and uh, the closest diseases is what you would expect for example uh, bi bipolar disorder is closest to mood disorder and so on and Parkinson's is close to degenerative dementia dementia uh, this is the same thing for closest diseases essentially just to satisfy that it does make sense and if you look at individual disorder dimensions of this 20 dimensional space uh, it groups all diseases uh, in some way and actually with some effort you can give names of the different dimensions they have biological meaning also diseases come in constellations for example in groups or clusters for example, this is constellation six, so-called, you know, analysis, which uh, has many late onset diseases. Okay, and another way to look at data is to uh, look at age of onset. For example, for autism, it's pretty early, typically, and for depression, it's much later in life. And if you're curious about different colors, it's male and female uh, curves in U.S. and also in Denmark. Okay, and inevitably you would probably ask me why, why would you do this? Uh, and hopefully I can build a case that it can be useful. Okay, so what we did is we used uh, three large data sets from uh, Sweden, Denmark and United States and we built a number of metrics for diseases and disease pairs such as uh, disease prevalence curves uh, 
embedding. And then we used known uh, genetic correlations and heritabilities to estimate a large number of unknown heritabilities and genetic correlations. Uh, essentially, for remember in the previous paper we did just maybe 100 diseases for heritability. Here, with this data set, you can do 11,000 uh, or more pretty, pretty easily. Okay, so you can kind of guess that under the hood it's uh, machine learning to estimate this and these are individual methods that we used. We, we be best performing is kernel reach regression and uh, yeah uh, other methods are pretty close but uh, significantly uh, lower statistically significantly worse performance okay and uh, this is uh, predicted versus actual heritability you can do this by uh, bootstrapping you can see that correlation is very good it's slightly biased you see because you have a non-zero uh, offset but it, it's pretty good estimate actually and for genetic correlation it's even better because it's non-biased unbiased uh, although variance is slightly bigger okay so again on x is actual genetic correlations and on y are predicted genetic correlations okay and the correlation between actual estimates from data and imputed values are uh, quite high not not perfect it's not uh, say 100 percent but uh, 87 plus uh, percent correlation okay and i'm probably going very fast because i didn't expect to do it uh, so fast anyway i tend to finish my talks with this uh, ad which can be used for recruiting graduate students for the work that we do and uh, keep in mind it was done by shackleton who was recruiting men only for a uh, trip to polar areas so he was saying men wanted but today it will be participants wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And as you probably know, long, long line of uh, willing uh, applicants uh, appeared in uh, Shackleton's office. Okay, and actually, I think that's it, which gives us plenty of time for questions. And once again, sorry, uh, I tend to put too much in my talks, so today I decided to make it more focused, and as a result, I probably had two short talk. <laughs> but I will happily answer questions if you have any. Fantastic talk. Uh, thank you, Andre, and thank you um, especially for uh, giving a talk in such a certain, um, such a situation. So um, we have plenty of time for questions, and I'll start. You know, you, you ask ask you why twenty. So I'm asking you why twenty. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one answer is uh, maybe three is too few. And since we have uh, 567 diseases, to, you should have probably 300 dimensions because uh, uh, number of dimensions should be much smaller than the number of words, right? Otherwise, it's not low dimensional embedding. But uh, results are pretty consistent if you do 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions. Well, 20 dimensions seem to be <laughs> just the right number for this analysis. But uh, in the perfect world, it's a model selection issue. So we theoretically can compare a different number of dimensions and see which one describes data better. Um, I'll ask, you know, if there's no other question, I'll ask another question, but also um, um, who 
for those who are attending um, virtual, you can also ask questions as well uh, using the virtual platform, and then we'll read it, out, read it out um, and have Andrew to answer. So um, my second question is, um, so when you do, you showed a very interesting analysis of uh, correlation between different diseases. Uh, and one of the things that are interest, I'm interested in personally is um, disease, uh, rare diseases. And in, in the space, in the context of um, finding drugs um, from other uh, diseases that, that they have already um, uh, marketed drugs. So in other words, have you done anything related to finding similarity association between rare diseases and then other um, other diseases that have uh, no indication or no drugs so that potentially uh, the rare disease because there are thousands of them you know there's no way that can be uh, studied one by one and we really need a large scale and the competition analysis that just like what you did so any any insights you can share with us uh, short answer is yes, uh, you can do this, but in reality, there are some difficulties. For example, I see the codes uh, tend to focus on common diseases, right? There are some uh, Mendelian diseases, but only small, small subset. There is over 8,000 unique Mendelian diseases known, right? But uh, I see the codes contain probably about 100. So that's one of the difficulties. But if you do text mining and you can have access to clinical records, right, uh, texts, you definitely can do analysis of wide range of uh, Mendelian conditions and non-Mendelian rare diseases. So short answer is yes, but, uh, and I'm sure in the audience, we have people who actually do precisely this work. <laughs> Do you, but do you also think that um, what what kind of role can the literature play? You know, uh, in this case, do you think there you know there are maybe case reports uh, published in the literature about uh, rare diseases? Do you think they can be a complementary source to the uh, electronic medical records? Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, essentially, in applications that I, that I just showed, diseases that are semantically close tend to have uh, similar heritability. And the same probably applies to uh, indicated drugs and so on. So essentially, if you have access to a very large data set of uh, medications and publications about those medications, you can uh, have both similarity of drugs and similarity of diseases. And that way you can essentially guess which disease uh, corresponds to which drug. So it uh, should be absolutely doable with a sufficient amount of data and uh, right data source. All right. Thank you so much. Any questions? Okay, and, uh, I forgot to tell. Thank you so much for having me. And I apologize for my sore condition. <laughs> and, uh, and clearly, I, th I think there, there's, a, uh, there's a question for Lars. I am great. Great talk. It's Lars from the here. Thank you, so, Lars. And thank you. I'm curious, so when you're modeling these disease trajectories, as some people would call it, uh, sentences, we know that in the data sets, we're often missing a lot of data that just random random diagnosis will be, have been not reported. Have you looked at how stable these similarities and distances between diseases are if you leave out random parts of the sentence? Because that's likely what you have in, in reality, right? Uh. Lars, probably ask you to repeat it because. Yeah, so when you're looking at a patient as a sentence and you have a row of diagnoses, uh -huh. zero diagnoses, then in reality, given how the hospital system works, you will often have some diagnoses that were not reported. So that effectively corresponds to having random words missing in your sentence. Yeah. I'm curious, have you looked into in your embedding space, for example, how robust it is towards having random dropouts? Honest answer is not. We, we, we haven't looked at it, but we, we definitely should. Uh, the hope here is that uh, law of large numbers uh, kicks in, right? Because when you have uh, hundreds of millions of sentences, uh, 
hope, hopefully this noise will uh, will be abated. But I agree. We that definitely should take a look. That will also be my hope, but I I prefer not running with the strategy of uh, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> Sorry, was it? Any any other questions? There's yeah. something in the Q and A. Okay. Looks like there's a. Is there a question from the online audience, virtual audience? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Great. Right. And there's a there's a question uh, from our virtual uh, attendees. Um, can you say more about how the embeddings are learned? For example, what are the inputs, targets? training process, et cetera? Uh, well, because I'm talking to text mining audience, I was kind of assuming that you know this part. But mm -hmm. uh, in a nutshell, each patient becomes a sentence, right? Uh, in the way we did it, uh, we had 567 diseases. So it's very small vocabulary. Each sentence has uh, vocabulary, well, several hundred words at most. And we have uh, 150 million sentences of this kind. And then uh, you pass it through a uh, bag of words model, uh, word, word to vec, which essentially is very shallow neural network, right? That tries to predict a uh, missing word from uh, words that we already have. And uh, this network gives you representation of uh, disease space. Essentially, you take one of the layers of this neural network and it becomes uh, embedding. Each disease has a corresponding vector in 20 dimensional space, right? And diseases that are similar tend to be closer to each other. And the training is done uh, well. You can do it in many ways. Uh, we use GenSim uh, package with uh, yeah some weeks of training because it's a relatively large data set. Thank you. And, I hope and it we makes have, sense. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have another uh, question from the audience, please. Yes, um, I'm wondering what kind of correlations across time your analysis is able to address. I guess particularly like. You know, infections in early life, how do they correlate with outcomes later on? Um, or maybe in the WordToVex setting, like how much, um, like, yeah, how wide a window do you, do you input to predict the, the missing term or something? I would probably ask Bianca to repeat because. Uh, oh, uh, well, why don't you come here? I think okay. if you ask a question here, you'll be. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, I was wondering about um, what sort of correlations between diseases you're able to uh, assess across time, like a particular interest probably is, you know, infections at some point, what do they, what diseases do they correlate with uh, later on in life? Uh. As somebody said, it's very deep question, so my answer will be superficial. Uh, first of all, in most data set that uh, I have direct access to, we see only short interval of patient's life, at most 10 years, right? So uh, it's technically quite hard to say what happened later in life, and even harder to say what was happened causally. But if you talk to Lars, for example, they, he, he works with a much better data set, which has uh, creep to grave, right? Span of uh, human sentences. So uh, theoretically there you can see much longer uh, regularities. Although in rare cases, for example, with COVID, which we also now have in data set, 
we probably can make uh, causal statements uh, in near future because uh, it's kind of unique experiment. Disease that didn't exist suddenly appeared in the whole world. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, we have more time. So, can you actually say because what you said about the last last thing about COVID data set you're you're having uh, sounds very exciting to me. Can you say a little bit more about uh, your current or maybe uh, future work on this? Well, <laughs> absolutely. Although uh, COVID, as you know, is very populated space, so uh, one should. You should be very careful with selecting subject because uh, we, during the pa pandemic we try to do several studies and usually once you finish doing something it's already published elsewhere so <laughs> it has to be sufficiently <laughs> different of what's already done Hey, Andre, it's me again. So one more, one more question. Nice to see you, Lars. <laughs> where you can see me and also better hear me. So I'm wondering when you're making this sentence description of the history of a patient, there's of course also, it's a, it's a great first approximation, but the problem is all the words don't have the same spacing between them in reality, right? You might have two diagnoses that comes with days in between, and the next one might be three years later. Do you have any thoughts on how you can generalize these text mining approaches to better model that rather than just be word one, word two, word three, ignoring the distance between them? Uh, yes and no. I, I, I honestly don't know the best way to do this properly, but uh, you can introduce essentially spaces, right? Like nothing, 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 uh, COVID. <laughs> brain fog, brain fog, brain fog, nothing, nothing, nothing. So that's one way to do this. Another way would be to explicitly introduce continuous time, right, and model intervals between events. Again, I don't know how to do this properly, but it would be a fascinating thing to <laughs> implement. Me neither. I would have loved to hear a good idea from you because I'm also short on them. 